people are coming up to join us. Uh, we'll start with opening uh, opening prayer. I'd like to ask Father Pascalis Lina to lead us into prayer. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Let us uh, take a moment of uh, silence. <laughs> Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for this uh, gracious opportunity for our encounter with each other as your beloved children through this uh, webinar. May you be pleased to bless our keynote speaker, Father Dani. And open, our mind, and open our minds with the gift of your spirit so that we can understand the material that will be presented by him. We praise your name now and forever. Amen. Uh, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Father Pascalis. Thank you. He is, he is one of our graduate student, doctorate student uh, at our college. We will proceed with the, our webinar. Good morning, dear college students and friends. Thank you for joining us in our webinar. Today we'll be discussing a very interesting topic, post-colonial studies and theology. We, we are honored to have Father Daniel Pilario with us as our guest speaker. But before we proceed with the presentation, I'd like to ask our rector, Professor Dr. FX Armada Rianto, CM, to give an opening remark. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Father Dani Pilario. Well, uh, good evening then, because he is currently in New York. Uh, <clears throat> you know that the audience of the uh, School of Philosophy and Theology is not uh, new for Father Dani Pilario because uh, he has been here already uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, Father Danny Pilario, for those who maybe are not familiar with him, uh, is actually the uh, professor of theology in Adamson University in St. Vincent School of Theology in Manila. But he is currently, I think, he's undergoing somehow like a sabbatical year in uh, St. John's uh, University, uh, New York. It is quite difficult to catch him up because of his uh, hectic schedule in New York yeah, to give uh, talks and everything. And I just would like to uh, express our own gratitude, you know, deep gratitude for his availability and very helpful uh, uh, kindness uh, to give us the uh, post-colonial uh, study and theology. As I remember, Felix Wilfred, Felix Wilfred is a colleague of Father Danny Pilario, and he also uh, was here uh, in 2018 with us. Uh, he says that uh, it is indeed our concern that Indian students, you know, for instance, uh, he put an example, Indian students are using Western professors to expand and apply their knowledge and research into the South. A student wanted to research on how FABC has been approaching the question of interreligious dialogue and nurturing a different theology of religions. But he could not do that unless 
he related this theme to the Dutch theologian Edward Schillebeck's theology of religion. But in fact, Schillebeck knew almost nothing of, a, of FABC or Asia. So this is one of the concern of Felix Wilfred that some uh, time he posed uh, in connection with the importance of the post-colonial study and theology. Well, that's one of the, uh, 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 how do you call that, the citation that I would like to, um, to, to mention about the Felix Wilfred and uh, post-colonial study and theology. Thank you, Father Dani. Again, uh, thanks also for the, uh, uh, this coming in this uh, webinar. And thanks also for the participants. Thanks to them as well, because uh, they are indeed very happy and eager to listen to your uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Father Armada. Dear colleague, uh, students and friends, uh, it's an honor for me to introduce to you our guest speaker, Father Daniel Franklin Pilario. He is a Vincentian or member of the Congregation of Mission in the Philippines. He is the present chair of social justice at St. John's University, New York. Before coming to New York, to St. John's, he was an associate professor and dean of St. Vincent School of Theology at Adamson University in Quezon City, the Philippines. He comes from the Barangay. Barangay means kampung or desa in Indonesia. Barangay Hagdan in the municipality of Oslo in the province of Cebu in Philippines. So he's, he comes from the southern part of the Philippines. Father Pilario earned his master and doctoral degree at the Catholic University of Louvain, Belgium. His book, entitled Back to the Rough Grounds of Praxis, Exploring Theological Method with Pierre Bourdieu, 2005, was awarded the best research in the humanities in 2003 from his own uh, campus. And he, was, he also has written after an a reflection of a happy theologian in and on the rough ground, 2014, and other monograph from the title, I learned that Father Dani loves rough ground. Yes, Father. But he looks guapo, although he <laughs> loves playing at the rough ground. He is a very prolific writer. He edited and co-edited several anthologies. It's too long to to read, but he also belongs to the editorial boards of philosophical and theological journals. Among them are HAPAG, Interdisciplinary Journal of Theology, Sian Christian Review, Concilium, International Journal of Theology, Institute of Spirituality in Asia, Pafisminda, uh, and the, the International Journal of Philosophy and Theology. Uh, he has extensively published in, in, in national and international academic journals. His field of research covers fundamental theology, cultural theories and inculturation, liberation theology, theological anthropology, methods of theological research, political social theory, theology and ecology, Catholic social teaching and justice and human rights. So he covers a wide area of research. Father Pilario is also a former president and founding member of the CATEO, the Catholic Theological Society of the Philippines. Very interesting. He is a professorial lecturer at universities and seminaries in the Philippines and abroad. But on weekend, he regularly minister at a garbage dump Paris in Payatas, Quezon City. Uh, during my study in the Philippines, I was exposed also to the dump site Paris, not in Payatas, but in Smoky Mountain, Father. So I know the, the smell 
the situation, but it's very interesting that he is not an armchair. Father Filario is not an armchair theologian. He is very down to earth. He is a very he's a well respected uh, theologian, theologian, but, but he also served in a poor parish uh, in a garbage uh, dump site. Uh, in Indonesia, it's like doing a pastoral ministry in Bantar Gebang, or we call it uh, tempat pembuangan sampah akhir. Uh, last night, I asked a friend of mine, because Father Filario was also my professor at UP Diliman, sociology department. I asked them to, do you have any inspiring or funny stories about Father Dani Filario? One of them wrote, I'll just read. I can think of funny stories about Father Danny now, she said. But what I know about Bourdieu mostly come from him. He is always ready to extend a helping hand whenever someone is in need, going the extra mile. So he is loved by our student, by my classmates uh, at UPD Liman, because he has not only a good professor, but also a very kind person. Father Dani Pilario, it's an honor for me to introduce to you. The state is yours. Uh, terima kasih, uh, Father Wayan, uh, Professor Wayan. Uh, I was a little bit afraid what your classmate will tell you about me. So I'm happy it is not bad. Uh, selamat pagi for all the attendants here and uh, thank you very much for uh, Professor Dr. Armada and the administration of Widya Sasana for inviting me to deliver this uh, short lecture. Uh, this is only two hours, so I would like to more or less summarize a little bit. Uh, into one hour or less so that we will have time for interaction in the end. Uh, one caveat uh, before we start is that maybe there are examples that I'm giving, but I, uh, I would like to, uh, I'm sorry that I could not give real concrete examples from the Indonesian context. I think the challenge for the audience is to apply the philosophical framework uh, not only into theology, but also in philosophy and other sciences into the Indonesian uh, post-colonial context. The topic today is a little bit, um, how do I call it? A little bit academic and philosophical uh, because we would like to ask how does post-colonial studies actually uh, impact into theological reflection and research? So in short, this is a methodological frame, mainly based on an article which I have written a little bit, maybe 10 years ago. But I would like to look at the way I do theology as an act of post-colonial thinking. Well, I don't really like to categorize myself, just as I don't also like to categorize other theologians. But the way our location uh, the, the way we look at our location, the way we find ourselves in the third world, the way we find ourselves in Asia, always have uh, a thinking that is post-colonial. So maybe I would like to uh, share my slides so that we can go on. Uh, just that jot down things that are not clearly explained so that in the open forum, uh, you can ask them again, and I can clarify better. Uh, I usually give this class for one semester, so it's quite a challenge, uh, introduction to post-colonial thinking in one hour. But uh, we will try our best. Okay, um, post-colonial studies and theology. I would like to start with a quotation from Edward Said. Edward Said is a Palestinian uh, social scientist, but he studied in the UK and has been working in the United States. He, he died like a few years ago. So, but he's one of the leading post-colonial thinkers. 
if you look at the location of post-colonial thinkers, they are in between. They are neither here nor there. They are both and, etc. So these are concepts that 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 will go back uh, directly coming from the locations of these post-colonial thinkers. Uh, according to him, ideas, cultures, histories cannot be seriously understood or studied. And this is wrong. Or studied, or studied without their force or more precisely, their configurations of power also being studied. So ideas, cultures, and histories are not free-floating signifiers. They need to be studied with the configurations of power, sociopolitical, economic, and cultural. What we must eliminate, according to Said, are systems of representation that carry with them the authority which has become repressive because it does not permit or make room for intervention on the part of those represented. So two things I would like to say from the outset before we start. There is a need to deconstruct politics of meaning. That's why ideas and cultures and histories uh, I would like to use the framework of Bourdieu, should be brought down to the rough grounds of historical praxis. They are not free-floating signifiers that can be like debated on until the coming of the second coming. They have their meaning, their meanings hooked into historical contexts. That is why we have to also analyze the context that produces the meaning. And second, this in the colonial framework, and all of us are colon, colonized, like Indonesia, Philippines, etc. In the colonial framework, we have been represented. And what we would like to eliminate or to deconstruct are those representations that do not make room for the subjects uh, that they represent. So this, these are two concepts, but let me go to just three, three main ideas that I would like to share this morning. I hope to be comprehensive. Uh, so in short, we can also like sacrifice a little bit uh, going deeper to its author, but I just, my, my only intention in this talk is to be able to, is to be able to bring the general frame so that each one of us later in our researches can go into individuals. Number one, when is the post-colonial? Number two, what and who of the post-colonial? And number three, how does the post-colonial uh, relate with theology? So let's go to number one. What and when is the post-colonial? Uh, I'll try to start first, first with the concept of colonial, colonialism and culture. Uh, the first assertion is that there is a basic relationship between culture and colonialism. Culture comes from the Latin word colore, and colore has a lot of other meanings. For example, one meaning is to cultivate or to tend. That is why culture is a cultivation of human mind, for instance. But actually, colore, the other meaning of colore in Latin is colonus. It has a re direct relationship for settling down in the context of power. Therefore, culture and colonialism connected with power has a direct, even direct etymological connection. Culture has etymological relations with power. And it is in this context that the discourse of post-colonialism can come. Because maybe colonial period has ended, but imperialism lingers where it has always been, in a kind of general cultural sphere as well as in specific political, ideological, economic, and social practices. So my, my point is post-colonial is supposed to be post. 
like like after colonialism but uh, that that post actually is debatable when is the post is it after we have been like liberated from netherlands or in the context of the philippines spain or america uh, or it is even starting during the time of colonialism so there, there is a lot of debate when is the post-colonial so this brings us to the question of what actually is the past because if the past continues to influence us what is in the past that continues to hegemonically influence us and the second is whether the past is the post whether the post is the post so it's a debate between the past and actually the post so you see there are the post let's 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 try we, we know the problems of the colonial let's try to look at the post the post means the aftermath of something so as i said the getting out of the people from netherlands is the post colonial but even in the context of ne Netherlands colonization or Spanish colonization in the Philippines, I would like to think that the post-colonial thinking is even coming together with the colonial period. So you see, there is a problem of the temporal view. When is the post-colonial? Because there is the, it, another that goes with it is the ideological view. Uh, because the colonial can remain in us. But the post-colonial has already been present even during the colonial era itself. Uh, I, I'll give you an example later, but, but, but for now, this, this, for instance, is a, is a concrete example. Um, for those, uh, there, is, there is something in... Uh, in, in the, for those who have been to the Philippines, there is something in the religiosity of the Philippines that is curious uh, to the missionaries. One of these is even during the colonial time, many of the Filipinos would actually line up in the confessional. So one Spanish missionary said that uh, it's curious that they would even kneel down in front of the priest in order to ask for confession, like 10, 20, or 30 of them, and will not let the, the priest go. However, uh, this missionary, this is a colonial uh, uh, diaries, this missionary said, but when they confess, they confess not about their sins, but the sins of their mother or their mother-in-law or their father-in-law. Uh, and and, and what, is, what is the point? Uh, what, what is the problem? It looks like these people who are supposed to be colonized are using a colonial instrument like the confession. Of course, in confession, you have to bear out your soul. It's using a colonial instrument in order to subvert the colonial relationship, which is asymmetric and unequal between the colonizer, priest, and missionary, and the local native. My point is, this, is, is that which I have been saying. Even in the colonial, the post-colonial has already started. But that's, of course, I'm trying to see, like, there are debates on the when is the post-colonial. Let me go back to Said because Said says the same thing. And this is why it is important for us to study colonial and post-colonial thinking because the past actually is still effective in the present. According to Said, he says, appeals to the past are among the communist strategies in interpretations of the present. What animates such appeals is not only the disagreement about what happened in the past and what the past was, 
but uncertainty about whether the past is really past, over and concluded, or whether it continues, albeit in different forms, perhaps. So the debate is not just about the past, what is the past, but about the post, whether that past is really past or it is still present and haunting us today. I'll give you an example in the context of the Philippines. Again, I'm sorry for my example because I am not confident to give example in the Indonesian context. Maybe in the discussion later, you would give those examples. Today, there is a very frenzied preparation for elections in the Philippines. One of the strongest contenders is the son of the dictator Marcos, who was the dictator in the Philippines from 1972 up to 1986. For those who studied in the Philippines here, they know that history. But what is interesting now is that Marcos is on the rise again. And they, well, they're like handlers, uh, PR machines, is saying that the time of the dictator is the golden age of the Philippine history. And that past and the way it is interpreted, of course, they denied the killings, the tortures, the ill-gotten wealth, Imelda's shoes, etc. That is not mentioned. But what is mentioned is the glorious era of the martial law day, days. And people are buying that. That's precisely the point why we need to critique on how a past is used as it influences the present. You have a lot of other examples if you go into the Indonesian history. I think what is important now is the what and the whole who of post-coloniality. Uh, what are the issues and who are the persons? I would only give four, but there are more, as you know. I just use these guys, these writers, in order to show basic directions of post-colonial uh, theory. Number one is the, 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 the discussion of the colonial subject. And in order to show it, an example, I would like to discuss the work of Franz Fanon. Franz Fanon is uh, from uh, Martinique, which is in Algeria, I think around that area, which is a colony of France during that time. And Franz Fanon is uh, uh, famous for the book, Wretched of the Earth. But his first book, which does not get a lot of attention, is actually useful for post-colonial studies. Number two is theorizing the West as colonizer. So post-colonial thinking is always in connection with the West and how the West sees the East. I, as an example, I would like to discuss the work of Edward, Edward Said, which I have already explained earlier, his, his location. Uh, next is the discussion on race and ethnicity. And this is a very crucial example because it's how other people look at us as an other race. But even today, how the different ethnicities ethnic groups in our own countries, in one way or the other, uh, exercise hegemonic colonization of other minor ethnicities. And I would like to discuss this in the work of Stuart Hall, who comes from Jamaica. And Jamaica is curious, is a curious, uh, what is this, a mix of Black Africans and the colonial experience of the British. Uh, the fourth is hybridity and third space. Uh, the notion of liminality, hybridity and third space. And I would like to discuss the work of Omi Baba 
Omi Baba is an Indian uh, uh, thinker who is actually also uh, working in the in the United Kingdom. So let's let's go and like try to get a sort of idea on what these these guys are talking about. Let's start with Franz Fanon. Uh, I would like to start with this uh, quotation from him. He said, every colonized people in, the, in other words, every people in whose soul an inferiority complex has been created by the death and burial of its local cultural originality finds itself face to face with the language of the civilizing nation. That is, the culture of the mother country. The colonized is elevated above the, his jungle status in proportion to his adoption of the mother country's cultural standards. In the Philippines, we call this uh, col colonial mentality. So, the more civilized you are, you're considered more civilized when you have appropriated into your language, into your ways, into your taste, the language, ways, and taste of the colonizing nation. What is lost is in fact the local cultural originality which actually Franz Fanon says is a very, very sorry enterprise. Now, let's, let's try to contextualize that. Who is Franz Fanon? Franz Fanon uh, lived from 1925 to 1961. He is a Martinique scholar. As I said, the more famous work is The Wretched of the Earth, 1961. Why? Because this is used by the uh, revolutionary nations trying to get independence, Africa, Asia, etc. But one theoretical work which he has is entitled Black Skin and White Masks, which is still written earlier. The main idea of Black Skin and White Masks is this. The question of Fanong is, how is colonial identity formed? And he used Jacques Lacan. Jacques Lacan is a French philosopher. And he says, in mirror formation, that means you only form your identity if you are face to face with a mirror, in imitation, but also in differentiation with the colonial master. So the colonized mirrored by the colonizer. The problem is, the mirror is always asymmetric. Colonial asymmetric relations. The white other is not only an other. I think I think it's 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 real. No, you want to know yourself. You need a mirror, someone we, who can tell you uh, this is it. This is it. Maybe you look like me. Maybe you don't look like me. So all, there's always a difference. But that in the, in the colonial perspective and framework, that relation is asymmetric. The white other is not only the other, it's not only different, but also the master, real or imaginary. It cannot really be, maybe the colonizer is a nice guy. Maybe he is the kindest person that you have lived in the world. But inside the imaginary, is the asymmetric relation. This is what Fanon was saying because he is a black guy, you know, and, and he was, of course, studying in France during that time. So you see that colonial experience. If black man is not a man, so if the black man begins to think that he is not a man or lower man, it was colonization that turned him to such a state of nothingness. The, this is uh, why the title of the book is Black Skin, White Masks. 
uh, we tend to wear the white masks in order to raise us out of the jungle of our original identities. What is the effect? The effect of the mirror relationship, a mirror asymmetric relationship, is that you are producing an envious man. The gaze that the colonized subject casts on the colonists sector is a look of lust, a look of envy, which the colonized actually experience. And, and if you look at if we look at our experience in being a colonized subject, we always long that I would speak a better English than my brother, or I would be more capable of taste like the European dreams of possession, every type of possession of sitting at the colonist's table and sleeping in his bed, preferably with his wife. The colonized man is an envious man. That's fano. Because actually, the end is destiny, white as destiny. However painful it may be for me to accept this conclusion, he said, I am obliged to state it. For the black man, there is only one destiny, and it is white. There you see the formation of the colonial subject. Uh, actually, uh, black skin and white masks, I heard, I have not watched this. It's actually turned into a film. And that film was is is the is the is the the, the video is here. Uh, maybe you you can go into it. But but looking at our personal experience as colonized peoples, I think we can feel that. For instance, in the Philippines, the whiter you are, the more you beautiful you are. So people buy all these whitening products. Do not go out in the sun, even if our world is too sunny. And even if the West would like our skin, our brown skin as their tan. But for the colonized subject, that's not it. If you are dark, you are not beautiful. See the formation, as a, a, a symmetric formation of the colonized subject. So what constitutes resistance? How do you get out of it? Uh, there is a black... Uh, a black uh, philosopher by the name of Senghor, he says, he says that we have to assert negritude, that we have to assert our blackness. Who would deny that Africans too have a certain way of conceiving life and living it, a certain way of speaking, singing and dancing, of painting and even of laughing and crying. So we have to assert our negritude. But that's Another problem, because you are falling into binary thinking. They are white, we are black, and we have to assert our blackness versus their whiteness. There is another thinker by the name of Gayatri Spivak, and Gayatri Spivak is an Indian philosopher. I think he tra she translated Derrida, uh, Lacan, and the others into English. One of her famous uh, papers is entitled, Can the Subaltern Speak? Uh, I will talk about that later. This is what he said in response to Singor. And, he, and she said, blackness, nation, masses, subaltern, or if you want to continue, the poor, or the Indonesian, the Asian, is in continual construction by its others who have interest in their existence or non-existence. These categories, categories which is actually invented, need to be always correlated with their dominant post-colonial others, which is also the crucial condition of their own possibility. I'll, I'll go back to that later when we talk about Gayatri Spiva. But I would like to give an example of what Fanon was talking about, about the mirror experience of the formation of the colonial subject. How to get out of it? 
An example of that debate is the Asian debate. And the Asian values debate is famous in Mahathir Muhammad, Malaysia, for instance, one of the proponents, or uh, Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore. Just to give an example, of course, uh, Fanon was not, do not know about them, but just to contextualize his frame. The way to be out is to be able to assert our own identity. And this is what the alien Asian values is all about. The debate is all about. Mahathir Muhammad says, many Western societies are morally decadent. Many Eastern societies can provide an alternative development and political model that may supplant those of the faltering West. So it's the East between the West. That in one, in, on the one hand, it is an assertion of non-colonial identity and post-colonial thinking. But on the other hand, you fall into binary thinking, which we will later on problematize. For instance, here is Lee Kuan Yew. Lee Kuan Yew, also a promo proponent of the Asian values debate. Lee Kuan Yew is saying, with few exceptions, democracy has brought good government, uh, uh, but has not brought good government to new developing countries. What Asians value may not necessarily be what Americans or Europeans value. Westerners value the freedoms and liberty of the individuals. The Asians value the community. So it's us against them. That is one form of post-colonial thinking maybe to assert beyond colonial identity that Fanon was talking about, that, but be, becoming problematic in the next person that we would like to talk about. The next person is actually theorizing the West. And this guy, Edward Said, is famous for his book entitled Orientalism, 1978, I think. He says, the West's way of looking at us is Orientalist. Orientalist means framing of the Asian as different from the Western. So if the Asian values debate is framing the Asian against the West, this is framing the West or framing Asians from the perspective of the West. Edward Said says, Orientalism can be discussed and analyzed as a corporate institution for dealing with the old Orient, dealing with it by making statements about it, authorizing views of it, describing it, by teaching it, settling it, ruling over it. In short, Orientalism is a Western style for dominating, structuring, and having authority over the Orient. So that's his project. His project is to see how the West has constructed us. So Edward Said, he just died 2003, is a Palestinian born academic working in the US. Orientalism represent the representation of the East by the West present in travelogues of people going to the East, for instance, that the East is exotic, exciting, wild, while the West is rational, controlled, etc. This is present in all these contexts. And this is, these are the writings that, that Zaid was trying to, was trying to uh, study. Uh, it's a critique, actually, uh, the work of Said is a critique of Western knowledge production process. According to him, the prob problem is actually binary thinking. The West is guilty of binary thinking. That the, to construct the West, it has to construct the East. The East is necessary for conceptualization of the West. Now, what is that problem? For instance, in all these writings, the East is dark, 
the rational, sensual, or inert, versus the West as exhibiting brilliance, rationality, self-control, or progress. This basic framing actually is present in many of these travelogues, history, novels, poetry, etc. Even until today, people will say, come to Asia and you will get the excitement of your lives. This is how we are advertised in tourism industries in the West. So someone from the West who would like an adventure would go to India, uh, China, etc. Because that is supposed to be exotic. There you see that binary thinking. Why I mentioned Lee Kuan Yew and Mahathir? Because Lee Kuan Yew and Mahathir is actually binary thinking from the other side of the world. It's the same binary thinking if we are not aware of it. And this is the pro problem with binary thinking. There are just two options, option A and B. And of course, the better option is in the person of the writer. From its earliest modern history to the present, Orientalism as a form of thought for dealing with foreign, with the foreign, has typically shown the altogether regrettable tendencies of any knowledge based on such hard and fast distinctions as East and West. To channel thought into a West and an East compartment. That becomes binary. Because this tendency is right at the center of Orientalist theory, of which Said says, which the West is guilty of. Okay, that's why his book is Orientalism, which is the sin of Western thinking. Practice and values found in the West, the sense of Western power over the Orient is taken for granted as having the status of scientific truth. That's the problem of binary thinking in Orientalism. Why? Because according to Said, Said the one, the writer, actually says that his side of the world is much better. Every empire, however, tells itself and the world that it is unlike all other empires, that its mission is not to plunder and control, but to educate and liberate. Whom will it educate? Whom will it liberate? Of course, the East. That is the problem of Orientalism. And in his analysis from colonial experience, whatever, as early as uh, the first Europeans coming into the East until now, you, in fact, he says, from Homer all until now, all Western writings is Orientalist. What is the way out? So you, you have a deconstructive moment. The way out actually is to recover the human voice. Humanism is the only, I would go so far as saying, the final resistance we have against the inhuman practices and injustices that disfigure human history. That means to recover the human voice of the colonized and not look at it from an orientalist point of view. Here comes again Gayatri Spivak. I have mentioned Gayatri Spivak earlier. Gayatri Spivak's project is actually to let the subaltern speak. That means to recover the human voice of the subaltern. Subaltern, you can say poor, the masses, whatever it is, no? those who have been excluded. The, the basic question that Spivak asks is, can the subaltern speak? His, her answer is, no, at this present moment, it cannot speak. It's not because the subaltern cannot pronounce words or produce sentences. The subaltern cannot speak instead because her speech falls short of fully authorized political speech. That means he could not really, even if he speaks, her, spe her, her speech is precisely looked at. 
in a lower manner than the rest. Authorized political speech. She says, too much gets in the way of her message being heard socially and politically. That is why a question like, like in, in, in practical terms is, we are question congregations or groups of churches can say, we are the voice of the poor. That is not making the subaltern speak. But to be able to institute processes where the poor can speak for themselves, and that's not automatic because socially, politically, so much has to be instituted in order for the poor to be able to speak, to for the subaltern to have speech. We do not arrogate ourselves to speak for the, for the poor, but for the poor to speak for themselves. Uh, you will have later on these this, uh, situations. This brings me to the third uh, uh, point that I would like to raise. And the third point is the question of race and ethnicity. I would like to uh, quote the work of Stuart Hall, a Jamaican founding member of the British Cultural Studies and the New Left Review. So he's from Jamaica. He's a, well, uh, indentured labor in Jamaica. That means uh, workers from Africa or placed in Jamaica to be able to work in the sugar cane industry. But he studied in the West and he became uh, friends with Western Marxists uh, together in that uh, British Cultural Studies program. And like, like Fano, Stuart Toll said, what I realized the moment I got to Oxford was that someone like me could not really be part of it. I mean, could not really feel at home in Oxford. I mean, I could make a success there. I could even be perhaps accepted into it, but I would never feel it was my place. It's the summit of something else, not mine. So you see, uh, there, there, there you see the formation of the colonial subject. And this brings him to discuss about the notion of race and ethnicity. Actually, uh, there is race, the concept of race is a long history. For instance, race is seen as biological and genetic. It's only in 1815 that a certain French thinker, anatomist called George Cuvier, thought that there are three races in the world. The white is the highest, the yellow is the second, and the black is the lowest. And that is genetic, biological. The behavioral differences is due to the biological differences. And this is precisely the rationale of colonization, that there are higher and lower races as constructed by the West, by George Cuvier, who first enunciated it. So even in the United States today, if you ask the Filipinos or some others, of course, they will not say it, but the lowest one for their frame is black. Well, the yellow, we are in between, like China, etc., no? Asia. But of course, the highest is white. That, that becomes problematic and rose into deeper consciousness in the time of last year, uh, Black Lives Matter that begins to revolutionize. But I was just thinking, this was, this was like 1815 and you only want to revolutionize now. However, it moved from color theory to the theory of natural selection, Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, no? evolution and capacity for adaptation to the environment makes for a higher race. A race like chimpanzee or whatever, Neanderthal or that does not and could not adapt to the environment is, is, becomes ex extinct, becomes lower, lesser. That which survives higher is adaptation. So you see there's a movement from genetic to adaptive uh, anthropology. However, after the World War II, uh, with what happened in Holocaust, the UNESCO said with a statement in 1950, 
that the race is not biological but a social myth. So all these racial whatever capacities is in fact is in fact uh, deleted by the statement of natural nature of race and racial difference by the UN. After that, talk of race comes the talk of ethnicities. So now it's ethnic tribes, ethnic identities. Uh, the, the program is not, ref, is not just assertion of ethnicities because and then we would be guilty of binary thinking. Like uh, one tribe in Java against another tribe in Sumatra, uh, each one asserting its own ethnicity. For uh, Stuart Hall, the idea is reflexive ethnicity, not to replace the old bad black subject with a new good black subject. That becomes, that is non-reflexive. And Stuart Hall defines what this means. He said, even as we are all ethnically located and our ethnic identities are crucial to our subjective sense of who we are, this awareness can and should never exist by marginalizing, dispossessing, displacing, and forgetting other ethnicities. That's a summary of reflexive ethnicities by Stuart Wall. To give an example of what he's talking about, he's not talking about this, but just to just to like contextualize. For instance, the value of uh, the problem of the Israel-Palestinian conflict. For a long time, the Jews have been persecuted worldwide from the Middle Ages until the time of Hitler, and they recovered and they gained their in independence and they get. Uh, their Jewish state in Israel now. But the, sometimes the use of victimization becomes a power in itself to assert against the Palestinians. So you see what happens in the Gaza Strip problem is actually a lack of reflexive ethnicities. It's the same thing that happened to Hutu Tutsi ethnic war or for for example, the Rohingya Muslims in, 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 in Myanmar. This is racist populism, which in fact would lead to ethnic cleansing. And all this repeats itself in history. This is the warning of Start, Stuart Hall to be reflexive in our ethnic, ethnicities and identities. Because that would bring again the problem of populist binary thinking. My last, I, I'm a little bit late, but let, this is my last, uh, last point here uh, before theology. The last point is, uh, is uh, uh, what's uh, hybridity and the third space. The basic concept from Homi Baba, I already under, uh, introduced him. Homi Baba talks about hybridity, that reality is hybrid, that reality is mobile, and crisscrossing cultures, creating new spaces, which are also realms of its resistance and contestation. So there is no black and white, there, real, uh, it's hybrid, it's in between, it's uh, mixed. Uh, later on, you will see these uh, terms like mimicry you know, in the colonial subject. The colonial subject mimics the colonizer, but actually, you know, but actually is subverting him. Creolization, ambivalence in the Spanish uh, Latin American context, mestizo, mestizaje, in with liminality. These are all products of colonial encounters. So you see uh, people are mixtures of everything. Like 
the Philippines, for instance, uh, the cuisine in the Philippines is uh, a mixture of Spanish, Chinese, uh, local cuisines, but also now Indian, etc. Because we have been products of that cross-colonial encounters. I think it's the same in Indonesia. I, for instance, I would like to react to that. Uh, uh, what is this advertisement of Malaysia uh, in the tourism industry? It says Malaysia truly Asia. So, what does it mean for the Indonesia? Indonesians. What does it mean for the Filipinos? That means we are not truly Asians because we are mixed. But Malaysia is also a mixture of races. Malaysia is Indian, Malay, Chinese. So what's the problem? What is truly Asia? And the others are non-true Asia. That's a problem again of, of uh, Homi Baba would like to point out to the notion of hybridity. And brings, which brings us to the notion of third space. The third space is the site for multiple and supplementary discourses where the colonized can challenge the imperialism of meaning. So you see the example. So there, in, in each encounter, in each colonial encounter, there is a third space that is created. And it is here that the colonized and the colonizer interact. In, on the one hand, we mimic the colonizer. On the other hand, we subvert him. And that example of the confession and the confessional in the, in the colonial Philippines is an example. Instead of using the confessional as, as an effective instrument to really colonize the minds of the native, the native, the Filipinos actually play with the confessional mimic the colonizer, went to confession, even begged the priest to hear her confession in order to get an edge to be known by the Paris priest. Because if you confess like every week, the Paris priest would know you. And one way or the other, uh, they construct that very unequal and asymmetric relationship of the colonizer and the colonized. That is the meaning of the third sp space. The third space is to be in between. Uh, it says here, the third space theory or hybridity theory examines how being in between several different funds of knowledge and discourse can be both productive and constraining in terms of one's literate, so social and cultural practices and ultimately one's identity development. So you have a first space, you have a third space and the third uh, and a second space and the third space is the space of play and contestation and resistance. Let, let me let me read this because I think this will summarize what Omi Baba wants to say. He says, cultural communication is not a mere idol relations. It will, in between these two positionalities is the third space of enunciation, represented by colonial factors like the general conditions of linguistic articulation, language, interpersonal processes, and institutional power relations, for instance, in the colonial context, like the confession, for instance, whose effects could not be totally accounted for in the agent's consciousness. Of course, let me go back to that example of confession. Of course, the Filipino native was thinking seriously and in a very devout manner, he wants to go to confession to be forgiven by God. But beyond his individual consciousness, something was happening. The Beyond what he knows and what he feels, there is the construction of colonial relations. In other words, beyond the intentions of individual agents, the socio-historical, political, and economic, and linguistic context engender a surplus of meaning. I think we have borrowed something which Gadamer and Ricker has used. Since I have bit, a little bit of time, let me go directly to the third and last point. 
And the third and last point is colonial theories and its relation, post-colonial theories and its relation with theology. The picture that I gave in this slide is used with intention. For those who have been to the Philippines, this is the devotion to the Santo Nino or the Child Christ, which is called Sinulo. We, have, we are celebrating 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines today, this year, 2021, no, last year, this finished. Uh, and and <clears throat> one of the symbols is the Santo Nino, the child Christ. Why? Because this is the gift of, the, of Magellan who disco discovered the Philippines to the first native whom he baptized. But, you know, how ingeniously the natives mimicked the devotion to the Santo Nino, but transformed it into the way they wanted. In Spain, where the Santo Nino comes from, or even in Prague, where there is devotion to the Christ child of Prague, the same image, this devotion, when people dancing in the streets, together with a small child in their hands and everybody like saying and dancing to the child is not present there. This is the third space of contestation where the natives and the colonized play and mimic the colonizer uh, in, in, in a way that they express themselves. But let's go formal and ask the question, so how does post-colonial theory that you were talking about applied in the whole of, of, of uh, theological enterprise. I think that's the main point. I would like to think that liberation theologies in Latin America, the enculturation theologies in Africa, and interreligious dialogue and theologies in Asia are post-colonial third spaces vis-a-vis uh, -vis Western theology. But that's too much of a conclusion and, uh, and a very big statement. Let me go in detail. For instance, Dalit theology in India is in fact a resistance to the caste system that has been oppressing the Dalits and in one way or the other colonizing their lives. Minjung theology of Korea in the 1950s to 1970s, uh, it, well, started with the labor protest against industrialization, Western industrialization in Korea. Burakumin theology in Japan in the 1930s, 1920s. It's called crown of thorns metaphor, uses crowns of four metaphor. is an expression of poor people vis-a-vis -vis the hegemonic dominance of imperial Japan. And later on, you have water buffalo in Thailand, pain of God theology in Japan, third eye theology in China by C.S. Song, Kosoki Koyama, planetary theology by Tisa Balasoria, and ecological and feminist theology in, in Asia are all expressions of post-colonial thinking trying to recover the voice of the human colonial subject. But let me, uh, so uh, in, in more concrete terms, in more formal terms, for those who are studying theology among us, post-colonial theories, the way Omi Baba, Edward Said, and all the guys I have mentioned, there are many I have not mentioned, are all used in these theological enterprises and fields. Biblical criticism, so, so Raja, for instance, is using post-colonial theory in biblical criticism. In church history and Christian historiography, the recent book edited by Felix Welfred, of which many, uh, many Asians contributed, the history of Asian Christianity is, an, is a fact of church history in post-colonial theory. Black theologies, decolonial theologies, feminist, queer theologies, etc., etc. All this, if you want to go back, they use terms, theories by the post-colonial thinkers I have mentioned and have not mentioned. But just to make it concrete, 
what are the specific and concrete forms of post-colonial theologies today? And this is my last point. Let me just give three. Number one is nativist hermeneutics. Uh, many uh, theologians today in Asia, in Latin America, in Africa are engaged in what is called nativist hermeneutics. Native nativos or nashi to be born, that means to be aboriginal, to be a native, to be indigenous, vernacular. Uh, actually, verna is a slave born in the master's household. Therefore, the verna is actually a very in-between personality. He is a slave and he can mimic the master because he is vernacular. Native, na nativist hermeneutics is to recover indigenous ways of thinking and feeling and being usually damaged by colonialist imposition for centuries. So for instance, work in enculturation theology to recover, for instance, the Indonesian values or the Indonesian thinking or the Javanese framework, etc., is called nativist hermeneutics. There are many forms, for instance, colonial correspondences. For instance, if you're familiar with charts craft, and his idea of dynamic equivalence, or a narrative enrichment, Koyoki Koyama, like for instance, a water buffalo theology. It's to recover a Thailand way of thinking with rice paddies and frogs and something like that, but also ritual parallels, etc. For instance, in Afri Africa, there is called the ancestor theology. All this is to recover something in the native, in the vernacular, in the aboriginal. There is another one. And the other, other post-colonial application to theology is liberationist hermeneutics. For instance, liberation theology, the classic liberation theology in Latin America is post-colonial. It's a move to deconstruct Western theology who started with the situation of the non-believer to the Latin subject, which is non-human. Oh, this is uh, uh, expressed by Juan Luis Segundo uh, and, and many others no? in Latin America. However, beyond the classic liberation theology, is actually people's readings or people's readings of the Bible. An example of that is in Latin America is the Gospel of Solentiname. Uh, but we don't like to go to Latin America. There are a lot of basic Christian and human communities in Asia who reads the Bible from the perspective of their lives. They are not theologians. This is a deconstruction of Western academic theological thinking to be able to recover the census fidei of the faithful. That, th this is not common. Even today in theological thinking, what is prized as meaningful is to be able to quote runner or to quote Iskilibix for that matter. <coughs> but the people have no access to it. All they have is their rosary, devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, a candle in times of need, etc., etc. To be able to do theology from the perspective of the people, well, from the perspective of popular religiosity, which Pope Francis wants to recover, is actually post-colonial in accent. Beyond that is actually identity-based liberation. Beyond, for instance, the poor, according to ethnic identities or gender identities, the poor has been homogenized by the liberation theologians. We're not the same poor. We're not the same uh, gender. So the woman in Asia, in Indonesia, suffer differently from the oppressed woman in the United States. So there is, in fact, identity, political theology. That's Number two, 
However, number three is the specifically post-colonial hermeneutics. And there are several theologians. Uh, I could uh, uh, I could cite some, Sajjat Raja, but many others who are engaged in this. And the theologians who are engaged in this are uh, go into, into three different phases. Number one, uh, the constructive phase. For instance, the examination of language, knowledge, histories born out of asymmetric, asymmetric colonial power relations. There is a politics of cons colonial construction. We ask these theologians first ask, in this biblical context, who has the voice? Who makes the rules? Which voice are suppressed? That is the deconstructive phase of post-colonial theological thinking. And there are a lot of theologians who is doing that by recovering uh, colonial instruments, writing materials, histories, in order to say that this is a fruit of power dynamics. After the deconstructive phase is the reconstruction phase. The next project is to reconstruct the founding stories from the perspective of the colonized. So for instance, the Bible has founding stories, but it is always understood from the perspective of the colonizer. An example of that is the Exodus story, which is important to liberation theology. But there are theologians from the perspective of post-colonial theory who wants to read the Exodus story like a Canaanite. Exodus story becomes hegemonic because there you have a very powerful a nation which is supposed to be chosen by God, a chosen nation, which in fact invades Palestine and throws out the Canaanite. What is the Exodus framework for someone who is a Canaanite. And that replaced again in the Jewish-Palestine conflict in the present situation. Number three is the hermeneutics of resistance. The aim is to highlight the ways how the invaded, often caricatured as the abused victim or grateful beneficiaries, transcend these images. And this the example of that is the confession, the, the confession that I was talking about. I will not re repeat it again. I have one more question and a conclusion. There are several people who are in fact, uh, well, critiquing uh, post, post uh, colonial theories and says, is it not unfair to criticize a colonial instrument like let's say, history written by a missionary from, a pers from the perspective of lenses which we just recovered and discovered today. Is it not a problem of anachronism, like interpreting? Because all these, whatever we have found in uh, exegetical, whatever, instruments or hermeneutics, were not available to the first missionaries in Philippines or in Indonesia. So are we not anachronistic? In order to answer that problem, uh, I would like to quote Talal Assad. Talal Assad is another Palestinian. He's a thinker, and I, I think he's a very interesting social thinker. And he said, criticisms of the past are morally relevant only when the past still informs the present. When contemporaries invoke the authority of founding ancestors against each other. In criticizing the dead, one is therefore questioning what they have authorized in the living. This is actually the deconstructive moment, but also reconstructive moment of post-colonial thinking. To end, let me say this. The post-colonial project is an effort to historize, historicize theological discourse by pulling it back to the rough grounds, to its socio-economic, political, and historical location. 
discerning asymmetric power relations it was complicit with so that it is prevented from unwittingly imposing hegemonic control, but will instead proclaim the message of salvation it was meant to do in the first place. Thank you and good morning. I'm sorry thank it took a little bit of time, but thank you. Thank you very much, Father Danny. Thank uh, you. For for shedding light on post-colonial theories and its potential appropriation for theology. Uh, to me, it was a solid uh, presentation, very comprehensive, and it seems that it has uh, upgraded my IQ about 20%. <laughs> uh, it's now time for question and answer. Uh, we have already some questions and uh, responses. The first will be from YouTube. There are about 40 something participants in our YouTube live streaming. The first is a word of appreciation from Paul Heru Wibowo, uh, giving thanks for the uh, insight regarding post-colonial theories. Uh, he said that, that these uh, points or inspiration or insight uh, help us to give power, voice to our local identities in the context of globalization, because there is a tendency in global, uh, globalization that erase uh, local identities. Uh, I'd like to give voice uh, to some participant to raise question. The first will be for Father Ketut, Timo Ketut. Would you like to state your question, Father Ketut? Please unmute yourself first. Yeah. I, I want to ask you some question. Just one question, please, Professor Danny. When we talk about theology, we should talk about theology in some way connecting to our daily life. Start from this uh, statement. How deep was theology and theologian help the colonized country gaining their independence from colonial countries? The second was in the past, as in Indonesia, as we know, all the theologians came from colonial countries. Of course, their thinking of theology influenced deeply the way they making theology in Indonesia, even in Asian countries. So what you are thinking about the local people? I think this is a pretty dominant among the theologians from the colonized country, colonial countries, I mean. How can we reconcile this reality when we talk about the local theology? Thank you. Thank you, Father Ketut. I'd Thank like you. To I'd like to continue with another question from Brother Pai. Please unmute yourself. Brother Pai is our missionary, SVD missionary. He was assigned first to Zambia. So he's familiar with, he's familiar with uh, African context. Brother Pai, please unmute yourself. Yeah, I, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Can please be brief. Okay. Um, just uh, in connection to what Father said about colonial, colonial remains in, in us. And um, actually, it is hard for 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 us or for people in Zambia to distinguish the time frame of the colonial uh, of the post-colonial. You can we can say, uh, as you said, it is um, the past influences the present, and I, and and it happened one day 
we change the uh, the corpus of the Jesus Christ in the in the church. Previously, it was white, and then we changed to, to black corpus. And they said, "But Father, where is the where is the white Jesus?" <laughs> and also they <laughs> and also yeah. they they kind of um, feel comfortable to to go to, for confession to the to the white father. Meaning to say to, to, to the priest who is from, from like I have a friend from Brazil and of course he is white and then they 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 would rather to go to that the priest from Brazil to, rather than to the the African one, for example, like that. And um, uh, in one occasion I also uh, kind of, uh, I, I was quite surprised that, uh, because when I was teaching at school, at the, at the training school, the teacher told the student, hey guys, uh, please think, don't think like a, like a black person, he said like that. Then I was kind of I was surprised and then I said, no, no, you, you will never stay like that. So I think um, it is hard to, to, to distinguish the, how the time frame in the sense of, uh, that feeling of uh, inferiority. And even for example, in Zimbabwe, the, the former president Mugabe, he just the white people from, from, from Zimbabwe, the, the farmer, because they, he said, no, no, these people, they are disturbing us. They, they don't give chance to us. And, and uh, of course they have a lot of uh, equipment for farming. Then when they left, they could not do anything with that uh, equipment they left. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Pai. Father Dani, can you give a response to these two participants? Okay, first, thank you very uh, much, uh, Father Ketut and Father Pai, for, for, Brother sharing, Pai. Uh, Brother Pai, for sharing your experience. Uh, my first point is in response to uh, how, how does theology uh, help liberate us from uh, from the colonization of daily life. It's supposed to be theology is to liberate daily life, but it looks like, you know, and it, the way I understand the question of Father Ketut is, it looks like many theologians are coming from the West and it's not, it's, it's, it's always a superior context. My, my answer is going back to the question of post-coloniality. Even daily life is colonized. And it's the same thing that uh, Brother Pai was talking about. Some Zambians would prefer the white over the black priest. Uh, that's an example of colonized mentality. It's always in relation to your mirror, and the mirror is always my desire. So, so that, that's what Franz Fanon was talking about. I always desire my mirror, my colonizer. And there's no, ad, no other way for me but to be white. This is the, the problem that colonial thinking has given, colonization has given into the identity formation of the colonized. So, so... So when you change the Jesus into a black Jesus, they were looking for a white Jesus because Jesus is supposed to be white. That's how they were trained. To be able to deconstruct that is a lifetime process. And that's, that brings us to the problem that uh, the question of Beatrice Pivak, no? the colonial or the, the subaltern or the colonial could not speak. And there is so much institutional courses, etc., education, re-education, etc., to bring out and let them appreciate their own culture. And, and this brings me to the question of the theologians from the West. I think all of us, or many of us here, are trained from the West. I graduated from Belgium, Armada graduated from Rome, or some others graduated from somewhere else. And we bring in what we have learned from outside into, into our own countries and cultures. I think our sin would be to be able to colonize them again theologically. 
I think the challenge of the theologian in colonized countries in Asia or Latin America or Africa is to be able to let the subaltern speak, express their theology, their ideas. That really comes from their actual lives. But that's not automatic. If it's not even automatic for us, because the way we and the way we discuss post-colonial theory now, and if you bring in a farmer from Indonesia, he will sleep like the last hour that I gave the lecture. So even that is, is a very difficult enterprise. But that's precisely the challenge. Is there other um, Father Dani? Do you think yeah. that uh, post-colonial theology has contributed uh, in helping countries to gain their national independence? A question raised by Father Ketut. Yeah, uh, well, it's not post-colonial theology. Uh, the fight for independence was a fight for post-colonial thinking. And even without Said, without Omibaba, etc. These guys were not existing during the time. Our ancestors already fought for our independence. And that is precisely why we ask the question, so when is post-colonial thinking? Some authors is saying, actually post-colonial thinking started during the time of colonization. When the colonizers were like, oppressing us or making us into slaves or making us follow them or mimic them, people were already exercising post-colonial thinking. And all these resistances, in fact, in the context of the Philippines, all these people who fought for independence are thinking post-colonially. Well, of course, that's our interpretation now. But what they actually wanted was to to set themselves free. And the Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon was very instrumental in helping liberate uh, Martinique and Algeria from French domination. And there are a lot of others, a lot of other examples that you can cite. Thank you, Father Dani, very clear. I'd like to give time to women, affirmative action for women. So please. Sister Ivoni, please unmute yourself and uh, is Sister Ivoni still with us? Please unmute yourself, Sister. Okay, Sister. Unmute, Sister. Please unmute. Okay, saya bicara bahasa Indonesia. Ya, yeah, sure. Oke. Okay. Uh, saya memahami teologi postkomunial seperti yang dijelaskan oleh beliau. Uh, dan kalau melihat dari realitasnya, uh, kita bicara mengenai perkembangan yang ada di Asia, tapi saya berangkat juga dari Uh, yang terjadi di gereja universal ya perkembangan uh, yang kita lihat ya seperti uh, paus yang sekarang ini adalah berasal dari luar Eropa meskipun asal muasalnya dari Itali uh, juga Seperti ya, Presiden Amerika Serikat juga ya, dari Afrika meskipun itu campuran ya. Jenderal SWD juga orang Asia pertama itu Pater Anthony dua periode dan sekarang ini bahkan dari Flores Pater Budi Keleden dan lain sebagainya. Nah, yang saya mau uh, ingin tahu lebih. Itu mengenai istilah binary thinking ya, itu uh, kemungkinan bisa terjadi uh, east versus west to ya, uh, pertanyaan spontan saya apakah tidak menimbulkan 
eh, semacam ya perang dingin baru dengan eh, kondisi binary thinking ini. Terima kasih moderator silakan membantu saya untuk membahasakannya. Terima kasih. Uh, thank you, sister. Pada Dani, sister was asking about uh, binary thinking and its effect. Uh, can you elaborate further on this uh, concept? And I'd like to ask uh, Father Sefri, is also our doctorate student here. Father Sefri, please unmute yourself and raise your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want to ask to Father Denny. Uh, currently, there is a tendency of cultural homogenization carried out by neoliberal capitalism. On the other hand, there are many local people who glorify global culture. They feel as human if they serve the global culture. They do not feel colonized by global culture. They actually feel oppressed by the local culture. How does post-colonial theology respond to this problem? Thank you. Thank you, Father Sefri. Please, Father Dani, can you... Okay, uh, first I would like to, to talk with, uh, to respond to Father Sefri. What do you mean by people liking global cultures? What, what, what do you mean by global cultures? Expression of that. Uh, global culture, like uh, hypercultural, like uh, McDonald's and the other, or uh, okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I understand. Does K-pop? Um, K-pop. K-pop. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Belong to global culture now. B BTS. <laughs> yes. Black thing. Okay. Uh, and I, you're you're right about uh, cultural homogenization. Uh, McDonald's is all over the world, or BTS is all over the world. Uh, everything is globalized, and people would like it more as against a local culture which they think is is one way or the other is oppressing them, uh, or like uh, which which they, they want to get out of their own cultural. <laughs> cultural identity which has been op oppressing them for a long time. So the way out is hyper-reality and global cultures. Uh, from the perspective of, of post-colonial thinking, I think the challenge is always to analyze each and every context and brings it to the political, social, and cultural dynamics. Why is this happening? For instance, let's try one global culture in Indonesia, Tuba Batak or whatever, Java. Ha, why, what happened when people felt oppressed in these local identities and seek liberation in global realities? Now, I, we could not, I could not answer that for the moment. I do not have those data. But the challenge of post-colonial theologian or philosopher is to bring that problem into into cultural into into the actual context where people give those reactions so you are right it's 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 very complicated because it's not that mcdonald's is evil because it's all cultural homogenization because it imposes itself into the indonesian or japanese mentality it's, it's not a given. It could be an act of liberation for the local culture, which has been totally oppressed all throughout these centuries. But another example is the hijab, for instance, or the burqa. For the West, the burqa is like an oppression of women, etc., etc. But for some Muslim women, the burqa is a way out vis-a-vis -vis whatever international imposition and assert their own identity. So you see each context matters and post-colonial thinking does not prejudge a certain context. It actually challenges the 
the analyst, the philosopher, the theologian, the social scientist to analyze it in context. And this brings me to the answer to Sister Ivone's question on bi binary thinking. Binary thinking is the challenge. Or, or the problem of binary thinking is to fossilize, is to like fossilize one, one pole over the other pole. So let's say the West, the, West, the Orientalist problem, the West always thinks that they are higher and they think that the West is lower. We are more systematic. The East is more uh, playful. We are scientific. The East is exotic. This fossilization is the prob problem of bi binary thinking. But we will fall into the same binary thinking if we begin to say the East is, uh, you know, religious and the West is evil. The East is uh, more uh, heterogeneous and the West is very homogeneous. So you see, this, this is the problem of binary thinking, to be able to fossilize identities. Well, it's the same thing with race, to be able to fossilize race. The white is evil. The black is good now. You see? Well, before the good, the white is good and the black is evil. This is what is like what we wanted to avoid with the notion of third space, hybridity, uh, 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 colonies, creolization, uh, mestizaje that everything is a third space. And that space is also a space of contestation. I don't know if I am clear, Sister and Father Sefri. You can, of course, follow up your question later. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father Dani. Uh, I uh, encourage everyone to dig deeper, to explore more on the contextualization of this uh, post-colonial theories, especially in, uh, in Indonesian context, let's say in terms of enculturation or something like that. Uh, Father Armada, raise, uh, raise his hand. Please, Father Father Armada. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Romo Wayan. <clears throat> thank you, Danny, for your indeed uh, inspiring uh, explanation regarding the post-colonialism. Uh, my question is this. <clears throat> so who are we dealing with in post-colonial study? As I listen to your explanation, uh, there is somehow a binary thinking that can uh, facilitate us to uh, really uh, understand uh, who we are dealing with. For instance, you mentioned about the West and East, or the Western and the Eastern, the, the, the Americans or the Europeans and Indonesia or India or the, or the Filipinos and the white and black. But uh, as I understand, could we also dealing with ourselves in the sense that, for instance, for the, in the context of the Philippines, between Filipinos of Pinoy and the uh, poor people with drugs, and the Indians with the Dalits, and we, the Indonesians, and the the communists, the communists, or the communist aspirants, uh, because you know somehow our uh, to call that way and method of thinking is just precisely like uh, in the post-colonial times. I would say that, uh, for instance, those who are uh, the uh, victims of the tragedy of the 1965 in context of Indonesia, they, they 
they are regarded by us not as a humans just like uh, the poor people in the philippines uh, currently speaking with drugs and they just uh, how to call that subject to the uh, order of the uh, killings from the to their they proceed and etc so uh, i think this is it possible also to apply let's say postcolonial study in this kind of the uh, reality which is indeed for me uh, myself is somehow like a very concern you know <clears throat> this is my first question the second i would go to the uh, let's say the theological problem that we are facing in indonesia especially with regard to the translation of the uh, holy eucharist it is indeed for me it's a quite strings you know, that we we have to have somehow like an how do you call it uh, exact ex translation which is actually actually not exactly done by those who did translation but uh, my critic is not only just translation but also our mentality of let's say uh, easily uh, having somehow like uh, how do you call that uh, not really freedom to to say mass in our own context of languages etc but uh, we are subject to the uh, translation which is right now actually is very according to myself i mean also some of us is not really good translation uh, so that two points that i would like to uh, discuss with you thank you thank you is there another one uh, father wayan or you want me to answer yeah father, father. 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 there is there is, there yeah, is one uh, response from father jack wijanarko before father valen okay okay i Go think ahead. he is raising question uh, on the relevance of post colonial post-colonialism to formation. Father Robert Vijanarko is also very... Okay. Thank you. Yes, Father. Yeah. Thank you, Danny, for enriching speech and lecture. Uh, this is just not a question that, in general, our seminary formations and our school of theology and even philosophy is the best agent to perpetuate the colonial thinking, colonial epistemology. We can only be baptized as theologian and philosopher after know how to think in Western scheme of thought. What do you think about this? This is the first and the second is that I'm still struggling. It is a new method or just a perspective postcolonial uh, theology. It is new method of theology or just perspective that help us to look at the the essence of our 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 research, our subject of research. Thank you. Thank you, Father Jack. Can you? You want me to answer now, uh, Father? Yes, Wayan? Father. Yes, for them. Okay, first, first uh, question of Armada. I think binary thinking is not only applied to colonial and post-colonial context. Of course, I gave that as an example uh, from Said and, and from the Asian values debate because the topic is on post-colonial experience. But binary thinking actually is a characteristic of the human mind. For instance, we always think in terms of binaries, like, like uh, Levi-Strauss uh, research on it should be moon and versus the sun, black versus the white, rainy versus sunny season. Th there is a seemingly a binary structure in our, our mind in order for, uh, for us to understand reality, which means uh, once one 
uh, one reality is on the one side and the other reality is in the other side. We tend to group people into two camps. And we know that this is false. We know that this is not reality. Black Reality is not black and white. It's all shades of gray. But we don't count the gray. We just count the black and white. And that is applied in politics. And your example of the Philippines is right. So all drug addicts for the president of the Philippines are evil. They need to be killed. And that's what he did. Well, this is also the characteristics of populist thinking today. Populist, populism is all over the world. Uh, Bolsonaro, Trump, etc. And populist thinking is characterized by binaries. So the elite, they are all evil. And the people, they are all good. But we know that this is not, this is not reality. So if there is anything that is challenge, that is a challenge to thinkers, it's, it's to deconstruct binary thinking in, even in our daily life, even in the way we categorize people. And maybe your example of whatever, 1965, which I don't really understand, I don't really know, maybe... It's, it's a challenge of Indonesian philosophy and theology to deconstruct binary thinking all over the place. Uh, and, and that's my point. This is not only in colonial experience, but this continues until today. Now, the translation of the Eucharist, I think you are translating it in, the, in Indonesia. Some others can help uh, uh, re respond to also to Armada because I do not know the real politics of that Eucharistic translation. I think this is still the remnants of the of Benedict the uh, document Liturgium Authenticum, uh, and it and its and its fidelity to uh, like uh, the Latin original. Uh, I, I have no comment on that, but let me go to the question of Jackie. The seminary program and the School of Theology is the best instrument to perpetuate colonial thinking. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a brave uh, indictment of we just asana. Uh, I think we will close shop tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, that that is a good that that is a good uh, uh, question because it places us into question. That means we have to think: Am I perpetuating colonial superiority, or am I letting letting the subaltern speak? What is the direction of my philosophical or theological thinking? What is the, the direction of our philosophical and theological curriculum? In the context of the Philippines, I know many seminaries who still parrots Roman theology and does not even let, let them read uh, documents from FABC. So you see, th there you have, and uh, I was hoping maybe more modern philosophy, but still the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. No, I, Thomas Aquinas is good, but the problem is the deductive and, uh, and, 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 and colonial thinking that it pairs with them. And the next question is on, is post-colonial thinking a new method or just a perspective? I would like to think that this is just a way of thinking. Good theologians, in the context of the words post-colonial, were in fact post-colonial. Thomas Aquinas was post-colonial, of course. Maybe he's going to rise in his grave and say, no, I'm not post-colonial who said that. <laughs> but to be able to deconstruct Augustine and bring, in, uh, and bring in Aristotle to dialogue with theology is actually post-colonial. Why? Because Augustinian theology was hegemonic during the time of Thomas Aquinas. And to be able to go against his converse and and colleagues in the University of Paris who has been te te teaching Augustinian theology and asserting Aristotle in theological thinking is post-colonial, is post-hegemonic, if you want. Now, the question, is, is, is this a new style? You can call it post-colonial or not. You can call it whatever, but you know that theology should deal with power. 
and how power oppresses, silences people. I think that is the role of prophetic theologizing or prophetic philosophizing. I don't know if I answer you right, but you can, we can continue discussing that. Thank you, Father Dani. Uh, the last question will be from Father, or responses from Father Fallen. Okay, hello, Father Dani. I have a question for me. I don't study deeply theology, uh, but philosophy. But my question is this. What is the true objective of this post-colonial theology? It just for self-esteem, we gain our trust in ourselves because until now the development country like Indonesia, Philippines or India, we lack of trust in ourselves. So now we have to, to fight or we have the global uh, objective. It means that a theology, theology is the way of living our faith. It means theology is the expression of human faith. So the expression is plural, many expression in every culture. And it's meant that uh, if we stress this binary uh, thinking, it's meant that Asia until now has no its theology. This is uh, my, my impression until now. But in this global age, is it possible to speak about local theology or local perspective? Or we have to collaborate in the connective theology, intersubjective the uh, theology. If in the philosophy we speak about intersubjective, could we speak about the intersubjective, interculture uh, theology? This is my question. Thank you. Thank you, Father Valens. Uh, another question from Father Handoko. Uh, he's one of our professor here. Uh, the 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 question is concerning uh, culture and local things in relation to God's revelation. Isn't it that we, if we put too much pressure on culture, localities, and something like that, it means that we are closing ourselves from uh, God's revelation in history, uh, which has a, a character of uh, what how do you call it? Uh, uh, I cannot, I cannot explain it further. But the question is like that: Are we not closing ourselves from anything new from outside? Eventually, we are closing ourselves from God revelation in history. Is it? Clear enough, Father Dani. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to <laughs> I'll try to understand it, but I, I think I get the main point. Uh, can I answer now? Yes, Father. And then I'd like uh, you to uh, give a concluding remark. Okay, you, Father. Uh, first, the the question of Father ba Father Valent. Uh, uh, can we not do? Local theologies, many expressions. The whole world can have its own expressions. Its, its culture will have its own expressions. Uh, any small ethnic con community has its own way of praying, of worshiping, etc. Or can we not do intersubjective theologies like we deal with uh, our 
uh, neighbor who is Muslim, can, can we not uh, collaborate with him and express our faith together? Actually, that, that is the intention of all, of all faith communities, to be able to express themselves authentically, their own faith, their own worship, and their own way of relating to God. If you want to uh, think of an objective, that's, a, that's an objective. And that's an objective of the whole Christian revelation. In fact, the whole salvation is for us to be able to have life and have it to the full. That's biblical. That's, that's, that's the intention of evangelization. However, that's not automatic. Why? Because powers have inculcated into us, have been inculcated into us. That makes us think that my expression of faith in God is lesser than the expression of the faith in Rome. See? So even if we want inculturation, even if we want to express ourselves together, even if we want to dialogue with the Muslims, there is always a document coming to translate the Eucharist in a context which is very different from what we really want to do. So this, this is precisely my, my conclusion. Actually, that's, that's a nice reality, Father. That is, I think, what we should do. But that's not automatic. Why? Because of colonial power. Or if you want post-colonial power. Or if you want any other power that still dominates us until today, it can be a local tribe that is dominating against its women or against its indigenous communities outside. There is always that power. And I think post-colonial thinking is our sensitivity to power, to deconstruct power so that people might be able to express themselves in their own authentic selves. And that is precisely my last point there. And my last point there, it says, the post-colonial project is an effort at historicizing theological discourse by pulling it back to the rough grounds, understanding its socioeconomic, political, and historic location to discern asymmetric power that imposes hegemonic control because it will not enable us to proclaim the message of salvation it was meant to do in the first place. I think that's the, that's the, the mission, if you want, of what is now called post-colonial thinking. And to answer uh, Handoko, uh, will, the, will, will the emphasis on local cultures not close ourselves from receiving transcendent revelation, if you want, is uh, emphasis on what is found in the local culture, not a hindrance to receiving the revelation of God. My comment to that question is this. There, is, there are no two levels of revelation. This is already proven in Vatican II. There is only one history. And that history is human history. Human history means our cultures. Human history means our, means our politics, means our economy, means our local Tobabatak or Javanese culture. There is that history. And in that history, God reveals himself. Because God does not come from the clouds. God can only reveal in the history. Now in Vatican II Gaudium et Spes, it's called the theology of the science of the times. And that theology of the science of the times, that history is problematic because it has been a colonized history. And that, that precisely where post-colonial thinking comes into place. In order for God to be able to celebrate our humanity, we have to recover the human voice which has been drowned by power. I think that's uh, also my last words, if this is already the last words, my, what I can say is this. 
the role of any theology is prophetic theology. And prophetic theology is to denounce where power dominates people and their freedom, their way of expressing their faith in their God. If power curtails people's freedom, theology needs to be prophetic. And that is the mission of prophet of post-colonial theorizing. Thank you very much and good evening. Oh, good morning to everybody. Thank you very much, Father Dani. Uh, thank you for giving us a very insightful, very inspiring uh, uh, presentation. I cannot summarize your talk, uh, but maybe on uh, maybe is the the challenge of theology is to promote a dialogue and give voice to prophetic uh, prophetic uh, resistance or voice uh, in in the context of human history uh, i'd like to because the time is up that we do not want to drain your energy father dani because it's already 11 p.m. now in new york no, I'm still uh, okay. I'm still awake <laughs> until three o'clock. No problem. <laughs> oh, thank you very much thank for thank you, uh, accepting our invitation to give a talk in this webinar. Uh, let us now conclude our meeting with uh, a prayer. Uh, I'd like to ask Father Father Pascalis Lina. Uh, before prayer. Okay, Father. I just want to thank on behalf of well, uh, with Yasasana School of Philosophy and Theology, Danny, for your, again, very generous availability uh, to wake up, <laughs> to wake up until now. Just, so it's already midnight, midnight, no? Almost midnight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's still 11. No problem. 11 p.m. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, thank you again. Enjoy your stay there in New York and greetings to Confers, Patrick Griffin, Flanagan, etc. Yeah, you're welcome anytime. Thank uh, you. With Thank Yasasana you. has been, is a collaborator and we yeah. are, we have a collaboration with St. Vincent School of Theology. So yes. uh, uh, only the pandemic would hinder us. By the way, <laughs> my last, my last, uh, my last announcement is my PowerPoint presentation is in the chat box. Okay, uh, thank you. You can download it. And the article which I have written uh, from which this talk is based, maybe it would clarify more uh, what I was talking about, is also in the chat box. You can download it for your own purposes. Maraming salamat. Terima kasih. Selamat. Terima kasih. Terima kasih banyak. Terima kasih. 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 Terima kas in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, we give you thanks for your guidance during this webinar. We hope that all the materials brought by Father Dani on post-colonial theology we have discussed can inspire us to recognize your real presence in our daily lives and in our encounters with its others. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Thank you for Danny. Thank you. Danny. Good evening. Good evening. Selamat Good evening. malam. Selamat malam. Good night. Eh? Good, night. Good, night. Good night. Good night. Yes, selamat, selamat malam. Selamat, malam. selamat tidur. Selamat, selamat tidur. tidur. Thank you. Um,
you.